1 Peter chapter 3, verse 12. Uh, we kind of started on this last Wednesday a little bit, but uh, the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you? Now you think about that. Who is he that will harm you? If you be followers of that which is good, but, and if you suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience, that's, underline that in your Bible. I want to tell you something, the value of having a clear conscience. There's nothing, you, you can't have enough riches in this world that are as good as having a clean conscience before God and before man. Amen? Amen. So anyway, uh, having, uh, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil doing. Now, if you remember that, he quoted Psalm 34. Psalm 34. And I'm not going to read uh, that tonight. We, we talked about that last week. But I left you with a question. Last Wednesday night, does anybody remember what the question was that I left you with? Anybody remember? If you, if you get it right, I'll let you mow the grass tomorrow around here. How's that? Huh? No, that's not it. That wasn't it. Melissa knew it because she got the answer right. There's always that one student in the class that everybody hates because they get it right. And it's usually a girl, right? Usually the smart ones were the girls and they always got the quitting anyway. Bless your heart, she got it right. The question was, how many eyes does God have? Oh, that's right. You knew you would remember it, right? If I said it. Anyway, uh, let's go to um, let's go to First Kings chapter fifteen. Turn there. Uh, these are verses that talk about the eyes of the Lord, the eyes of the Lord. Remember, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That's where he found grace, and I, and I always looked at that verse. When you find something, generally it's because you were looking for it. Noah knew where he could find grace from. You remember the question that God left David with? When David disobeyed and numbered the, the armies of Israel, God told him not to, Satan provoked him. And God was going to get him for it. And God said, well, I'll give you two choices. You can either let me judge you or you can let man judge you. And you remember what David's choice was? David said, God, I'll let you judge me. Because men, I don't trust men. Men don't show mercy. God shows mercy. And even though you might have to pay a price in this life for some of the things that you've done, some of the choices you made... It is still far better to look toward God and let God have it and let God deal with it rather than man. Because man will not show any mercy, but God always shows mercy. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. It's because he went looking uh, for grace. Uh, and you're there in um, 1 Kings. Hang on to that. Deuteronomy 13, 18. When thou shalt hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God to keep all his commandments, which I command thee this day. To do that which is right in the eyes of the Lord thy God. Now, we're living right now in a time, I can remember preachers, when I was a boy, I can remember preachers warning about a day that would come to America where people would be living in open sin and think nothing of it. You see... When I was growing up, there still was a certain amount of modesty, decency. Um, adults were careful not to curse in front of children. Remember those kind of days? 
People still had some somewhat of a respect for God and for churches and things like that. And I remember preachers warning about a time when those things would go away. And I think we're living in that time right now. Because if you ask people, just people that you work with, people that you might meet, uh, and I'm talking not necessarily the older generation, but a younger generation that's grown up in this nation living with the mo lack of morality that exists in this nation. Asking them, do you think it's wrong for two people who love each other to live together without marriage? 99 times out of 100, they're going to say, I don't see anything wrong with that. And the reason why is they're probably doing it. Do you see anything wrong with uh, cohabitating before marriage? I don't see anything wrong with that. Do you see anything wrong with uh, children being born? At, you remember the stir that Oprah made years ago when there used to be a phrase called an illegitimate child. What did that mean? A child born to people out of wedlock. Oprah is the one who opened Pandora's box on that thing and said she hated that term, wasn't going to use it anymore. And of course, her audience cheering her on and things like that. There is no child that's illegitimate and on and on and on. But the point was, we were starting to see children being raised in this country without the benefit of having a mother and a father that were married to one another. And liberalism and a lack of Bible in this country has said to America, we don't need the family structure the way the Bible structures the family. We don't need that. We can do just fine doing things our own way. And what you have now is we live in a world, we live in a country where people do that which is right in their own eyes. Well, this is, I like, I like my life this way. If I want to, if I want to cohabitate with somebody, I'll cohabitate with them. If I want to fornicate, I'll fornicate. If I want to sit at home and watch my dirty videos, I'll watch my dirty videos. If I want to drink, I'll drink. If I want to smoke marijuana, I'll smoke marijuana. If I want to take drugs, I'll take drugs. If I want to do something, then I'll do it. And we're on the verge in this country of probably legalizing marijuana in every state. It'll probably come through the Supreme Court one of these days. That's probably how, just like that deal about marriage between a male and a female was handed down to the people of the state of Missouri. It'll probably be handed down that same way. We're on the verge of legalizing most things that are immoral and taught against in the Bible. And people, so now you can go to, where, where is it you can go right now and smoke marijuana legally? Colorado? Where else? Nevada? Washington State, Illinois still, it's that you can use medical marijuana, but you can't just do it for recreational purposes. But we're on the, so these states that have declared it is now legal to smoke marijuana, legal does not mean right. Amen. It's legal to kill an unborn child. That doesn't make it right. Amen. There used to be laws in America ag against sodomy. Yep. But now we've thrown those laws out, made it legal. Making it legal doesn't make it right. Amen. God bless the people of Kenya who still to this day are rejecting any notion of ever legalizing sodomy in the nation of Kenya. God will bless them while he's cursing America. Just because it's common, you listen to me, young people, listen, just because it's commonplace doesn't make it right. Just because a majority of people do it doesn't make it right. Just because it's legal doesn't make it right. Just because friends are doing it and getting away with it. Just because you know somebody whose parents say it's okay for them to do this or to watch this or to participate in this, that doesn't make it right. Amen. Gone are the days when we relied upon the government to be the moral compass of America. Those days are gone. Most of our lawmakers are lost.
Most of our lawmakers, while they swear in a Bible and they may talk favorably about the Bible, they never read it and probably don't believe most of what it says. And yet at election time, they're sure to bring out a Bible to get elected. And what I'm saying to you is we don't, we cannot rely upon the government anymore to be the moral compass for the people of America. If this is the government of the people, by the people and for the people, then it's up to the people of America to decide our morality since our government no longer chooses to do so. And in Deuteronomy, he said, the things that I command you, you are to do that which is right in the eyes of the Lord. Knowing, number one, that God sees everything. And number two, God is going to judge everything. Okay? Uh, does it bother you? And I'll just, I'll admit when, when it, when, if I know that somebody is getting away with something, that irritates me and I just, I want to go do something about it. Am I alone in this? No, we all do. Well, one of the things I've had to learn is God sees everything. God knows everything. God saw it, God saw it before you did because God saw it from the foundation of the world. And I assure you, and God's had to say, Mike, chill. I'm the one who judges. It's my wrath that's going to be poured out, not yours. And I see everything that's done. And by the way, Mike, that means I also see the stuff that you do too. So God's had to remind me, Mike, you need to back down a little bit. Because you're not all holy and righteous Sometimes as you portray yourself, God sees me as well. Okay? Uh, in 1 Kings chapter 15. Now in the 18th year of King Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, reigned Abijam over Judah. Three years reigned he in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Maacah, the daughter of Abishalom. And he walked in all the sins of his father, which he had done before him. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God as the heart of David his father. Now I want you to look at verse 4. Nevertheless, for David's sake, did the Lord his God give him a lamp in Jerusalem to set up his son after him and to establish Jerusalem. Verse 5, here's why. Because David did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord and turned not aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, save only in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. And I want you to notice what this is saying. Here is a young man uh, by the name of Abijam. He now is the king of Judah and Benjamin. You know, the, the tribes have, there was a civil war. And the ten northern tribes made their own country. That was Israel. And then the two other tribes, Judah and Benjamin, they were referred to as Jerusalem. But it was the tribe of Judah, primarily, and they split, so they had two different kings. And I want you to notice, the decisions that you make in life, how far they carry. God could have thrust Abijam out because he walked in all the sins of his father. He was not perfect with the Lord his God. So that means he had done everything wrong that he could. And yet, God maintained him being a king because he was of the line of David. And he did it for one reason. That was because of the decisions that his, I'm, I don't know if David is his grandfather, great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather or what. But God allowed Abijam to reign over Judah and maintained his kingdom. And he didn't do it for Abijam. He did it for David, who had already died years and years and years ago. And what this tells us is your decisions, how you lead your life, how you live your life right now, and the choices you're making... Do not just affect you. 
they could affect your great, great grandchildren. And God bless your great, great, great grandchildren because of the things that you did right. Or God curse your great, great grandchildren because of the things that you did wrong. See, again, this is not about the times that we live in and it's okay to do this now and it's okay to do this now. Whereas back then, I mean, we couldn't get away with it. But now we can. Times have changed and we've got to roll with the changes. So I guess our morality can change too. Not in God's eyes, they can't. Amen. If God said this is wrong, if God said it was wrong 2,000 years ago, it's still wrong. If God said it was wrong in the Ten Commandments, it's still wrong. Uh, well, I got stories to tell, but I better move on. So you, you consider your life and the choices that you make and the things that you do, judge them not on the basis of what you think is right, not on the basis of what your wife or your husband says is right, not on the basis of what the world around you says is right, but on the basis of what God says is right. And you do that which is right in the eyes of the Lord. And I promise you, you could very well be passing on a blessing down to your fourth generation. Second Chronicles 16. Look at there. Who in here is weak? Raise your hand. That's me. And something that I don't do a lot of, every now and then I will, but most of the time I don't usually defend myself. And I've had people tell me, like my mother, my dad, when I was a boy, you need to stand up for yourself sometimes, son. It really wasn't in my nature. It was a whole lot easier to run and cry. Then I've had people tell me that. I've had my wife tell me that at times. And most of the time, I would just rather not get into it. There's somebody made me aware of a blog that somebody wrote about me. And I... I hadn't heard this before I read it. I read the article and I went, boy, you talking about nitpicky. They're nitpicking me like crazy. And I was going to comment and just let them know how wrong they were. And I'm going, nah. And here's why. Second Chronicles 16, 9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Herein thou hast done foolishly, therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars. That verse is telling you. God's eyes are everywhere looking at everything in every situation. Non-stop, 24 hours a day. God's, the NSA has got nothing on you compared to what God's got on you. Amen? And if somebody is doing you wrong, don't you think God knows about it? If somebody's doing you dirty, do you think God saw it? If somebody is stabbing you in the back, somebody's plotting against you, if somebody is spreading evil about you and all over the place, don't you think God knows about it? In fact, God knows it more than you do. And according to this, God is just looking for a reason to show himself strong on your behalf. Amen. In other words, I, I want to put it like this and understand where I'm getting at. Sometimes God is just looking to get the fight started on your behalf. Okay? If my sister were here, she would tell you. Most of the time, she would have to stand up for me. I mean, we called her Amazon for a reason. She was a big girl, okay? And uh, she could hit pretty hard too, from what I remember. And if kids started picking on me on the bus, she'd stand up and say, leave my brother alone. I'll jack your jaw. Okay? And they knew her. They knew me, but they knew her. And then we'd get off the bus and she'd kick me in the backside and said, you idiot, won't you? <clears throat> yeah. Then I would get it from her is what I'd get. 
But I'm just saying, I mean, this whole thing in First Peter is about persecution, suffering persecution. Now, I'm split two ways here. Number one, I believe in our right to carry and bear arms. I believe in it. I believe in our God-given right to defend person, to defend property, to defend family, and to de defend liberty. Okay? I believe in that. It's, that's what America stands for. Amen. But I'm also not looking for the fight to start. Okay? I know some guys that are. Okay? <laughs> Rich Kelly. <laughs> I mean, he's ready. Okay? I'm just telling you, the man's ready. Okay? So I, I told him at his church, I said, Reg, and I, and I said, I mean this. I said, I'll say this in front of your whole church. When the fighting starts, I'm going to be behind you one all the way. <laughs> And I mean that. I'm going to be right behind you the whole time. But I'm also seeing that at some point, persecution is going to start. And I'm not sure how it's all going to go down. But I think God's going to let us know very quickly that our sidearms are not going to matter a whole lot when this happens. And I think God is going to tell us the difference. I think he's going to show us. This is how it's, okay, now it's time to fight, but then don't, because it's not going to work, because I'm going to let them overcome you, okay? I think God will let his people know, don't you? The eyes of the Lord run to and fro. By the way, you have a, you have a uh, adversary, the devil, and how is he moving? And God's following him everywhere he's going. Okay, God, see, God knows it, God sees it, and God's watching out for him. Proverbs 5.21, for the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth all his goings. Amen. The ways of man. He didn't say the acts and deeds of man. He said the ways of man. God's eyes are on you so much, God knows your intentions. God knows what you're thinking about doing. And most of the time, God's going to try to talk you out of it. And the one time that God doesn't talk you out of it, he's letting you go do it just to show you. See, I tried, I was going to talk you out of it, but no, I thought, I want to let you go do it this time just to see how, because you know now how it works, don't you? Proverbs 15, 3, the eyes of the Lord are where? In every place. Does that include hell? Yes. Does that include where Jonah tried to go? Absolutely. The eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. God knows it. God sees it. It's not a surprise. It's not a shock to him. And I promise you, God is going to handle it. God's going to deal with it. God's not going to leave it hanging in the air like my sixth grade principal did. That was one of those times where... I don't know, I don't know, I don't remember why the kid hit me in the mouth at recess. But Tim Moppin popped me, a good one, right upside my head, gave me a bloody lip, sixth grade, the bell rang, so I went running to the principal, and I said, Tim Moppin hit me in the mouth. He said, I'll get him. Never did. And I saw him, he was in the paint department over here at Walmart a few years ago. I think he's died now. But I said, you don't remember me. I said, but I was, you know, sixth grade, 1970, whatever that was. And he said, yeah. And I said, there was a time I came to you with a bloody lip and I told you who did it. And, I, and you said, I'll get him. And he said, I bet I did, didn't I? I said, no, you didn't. You still got it. It's still hanging there. I'm just wondering if you're going to do anything about it. He laughed. I don't know. Maybe God was just saying, Mike, sometimes you need to not talk. Because that was the same year I wrote 2,800 sentences saying, I will always remain silent during class time. Because I had a mouth problem. 
Anyway, Proverbs 22, 12, the eyes of the Lord preserve knowledge and he overthroweth the words of the transgressor. You look at that. Number one, God's eyes have always been on this Bible. Have they not? God's eyes has always preserved this Bible. If there was ever in a manuscript somebody writing it wrong, I guarantee you God saw it and somehow, some way made them write it right. I'm just telling you, God preserved the manuscripts, he preserved the words, and he preserved it right here in this book for us. We don't have to question whether or not God's here. Amen? God did that, and he overthroweth the words of who? The transgressor. Think about it. That goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. The words of the transgressor is what came out of Satan's mouth. Yea, hath God said. Questioning God's word, contradicting God's word, replacing God's word. Well, I promise you when Jesus comes back and that sword's coming out of his mouth, he's going to overthrow the words of the transgressor. Amen. Now, let's see here. Amos, behold, the eyes of the Lord God are upon the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from off the face of the earth, saving that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, saith the Lord. In other words, God, God knows how it is. Now, how many eyes... Does, turn to Zechariah chapter 4. How many eyes does God have? Mm -hmm -hmm. This one, I was going, wow. I never thought of it that way before. Zechariah chapter 4. Is that right? Okay, I don't know what he said, but anyway, I'm sure it was interesting. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 1. The angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep. And said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick of gold, all of gold, with a bowl upon the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the top thereof. Now, we know what that is, don't we? There's a picture of it in the tabernacle in the book of Exodus. But then we see the real one in heaven in Revelation chapter 4. It's the seven golden candlesticks. And they are the seven what? The seven spirits of God. And that's in Isaiah chapter 11. So in verse 10, he says, For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice... And shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven, meaning those seven candlesticks. And he said, they are the eyes of the Lord, which run, look at there, to and fro through the whole earth. So how many eyes? Seven. Now, I know that's weird. I know that's not the picture you drew. But that's what it says here. With those seven, and he was, and what he was doing, he's talking about those seven pipes, those seven candlesticks, those seven lamps. Now think about it. What does the number seven represent? Perfection and completion. Meaning that if God numbers it seven, then there's nothing to be added to it. There's nothing that can be diminished from it. It's perfect. It's absolute. It's complete. It's that's, I mean, that's how it is. So with seven eyes, God is able to see everything. Amen. I mean, think about it. With, if you don't have any eyes, you can't see anything. If you are one-eyed, you can kind of see, but you can't see as much as you can with two eyes, God designed it that two eyes give you depth perception. Because this is the miracle, the, one of the miracles of the brain is that you're seeing stereo vision. Your eyes are separated. And I don't know if you notice this or not, but they're both seeing from two different angles. Right? I mean, if you hold your finger out here and you look beyond your finger. Come on, everybody. Stick your finger out here. You hold your finger out here, and if you look at beyond your finger, how many fingers do you see holding up there? You got two. I thought he was going to say seven. Okay? Well, that's because the eyes are trained beyond that, and they're both stereoscopic in vision. But if you focus on your finger, how many fingers do you have? You got one. 
But you're able then to perceive depth behind that finger. Uh, 3D movies used to just fascinate me when I was, I, the creature with, from the Black Lagoon was the first one I ever saw. And you got the, the red and the blue glasses. You remember those? You got a red and that's because they filmed it with one camera shooting in red and one shooting in blue, knowing that one eye would pick up only the red and the other eye would pick up only the blue and it would give the person watching it the ability to see in depth. And you're here at the movie and you're seeing the creature of the Black Lagoon and I'm going, oh, that is the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. Look at that. It's three and you just want to go, I can almost touch it. That fascinated me, okay? So anyway, now, that's just with two eyes. You're able to perceive all this depth and all these things. That you, but God's got seven. I cannot even fathom what all God sees, but I know that God sees everything, everywhere, all at once, past, present, and future. Whew. That's big. Don't question God on whether he's doing the right thing for you. Know that he is and he never makes a mistake because he can see things that you'll never be able to see with your two eyes. Amen. Now, if you want a double witness of that, go to Revelation chapter 5. Go to Revelation chapter 5. Oh, I love this. This is about the book sealed with seven seals. Hmm, that's interesting. God can read it with seven eyes. I guess God's a speed reader, amen? He just reads it just like that. But anyway, uh, look at, if you look at verse 4, I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and read the book therein, neither to look uh, thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, uh, and, and of the four beasts, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. God knows it. God sees it. God is aware of it. God is able to see everything you've done, are doing now, will ever do and God is able to see what everybody else is doing at all times and in every place and there is nothing outside of the eyes of the Lord and so when it comes time let's say that let's say that you are being persecuted let's say that there's just a situation going right now that I mean devils are just kicking on you and people are just trying to tear you apart okay can we not see this coming Okay, there's a man in, in the White House that the liberals and the progressives, they hate this man so much that they cease not day and night trying to figure out how to destroy this man. And he's lost. As these people gain power and control over this nation, the spirit that is in them, I promise you, is going to turn against those who believe this book and who believe in the blood and they will not stop until Christianity is destroyed in this nation. Mark it down. Do you believe that? Amen. Okay. It's going to happen in Revelation, uh, Revelation 13. Look at here. Revelation 13. Verse 6. He opened his mouth and this is the beast. He opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to do what? To overcome them. You say, well, that's, that's going to happen in the latter days. We're not going to be here anymore. The spirit of Antichrist is already at work. The spirits that are going to promote the Antichrist and set up his kingdom, they're already around right now and has if God has not restrained them, and if God does not restrain them, they will tear you apart. God allowed it to happen to Job, and Job had done nothing wrong. 
Job was our example of suffering. Christ also was our example. Because as you read the rest of this chapter, you'll see that when Christ suffered, he didn't suffer for anything he did wrong. In fact is, he suffered for what you'd done wrong. So, why wouldn't we follow in the example of Christ to suffer wrongdoing at the hands of evil people when we have done nothing wrong either to them or anybody else mark it down you're going to suffer you're going to be persecuted that's that's how Bible Christianity is supposed to work amen now let's go back to first Peter chapter 3 I'm gonna hit on something and then we'll pray First Peter chapter 3, verse 14. But, and if ye suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye. Be not afraid of their terror. Don't be afraid of them. Neither be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. You've heard me say this before, but if you'll study the book of Acts, you'll see that the church was persecuted. And when they got persecuted, they went everywhere preaching and teaching Jesus Christ. You know why? Because every place they were run out of, they were in a new place. People would say, why are you here? It's because we are followers of a man by the name of Jesus. Let me tell you about the Jesus that we follow and why we're willing to suffer great loss for his sake. He died for us. He died for our sins. We've never known a man who would die for us when we were in sin and yet Christ died. And that's the testimony that they had for everybody. So verse 16 again, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil, have used evil doers and may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. And they are going to do that. They're going to make stuff up and you ought to be glad that they have to make stuff up instead of writing what really is true about you. So when I, people tell me about websites somebody put up that, that doesn't like me, I mean, I'll go take a look at it, but I'm just going, oh, thank God that they didn't put that, that other stuff in there. <laughs> Amen? Thank God that he covered that, Amen. blotted it out, or else I'd be dead. Okay? Verse 17, for it is better... If the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. For Christ hath also suffered, uh, hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Let me ask you a question. What did Jesus take with him to the cross? From this, from the life that he lived, what did Jesus take with him to the cross? Not a thing. He didn't have his pockets full of money. In fact, he didn't have pockets because he wasn't wearing anything. They stripped him down. They put a crown of thorns on him. And he was as bare as the day he was born, having lost everything in this world and died at a young age. Okay? Now, turn your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit on this and then we'll pray. Philippians 3, 7. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. So, two columns. One is a profit column. One is a loss column. Everything that you've worked for in this life, everything that you've built, everything that you've saved up for, everything that you have, you've got it in the profit column. These are things that are yours. They're by, by rights. You earned them. You worked for them. You've saved up for them. You did this. You did that. And you've got that, all of that in the profit column. And then one day, you take every one of those things and you put them in the loss column. Because, yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the exit. In fact, let me show you this. You're looking at what the Bible calls, what Paul called dung. Dung. House, nice car, money in the bank, pool, hand-me-downs from your grandparents and great-grandparents, and you got a house, you got a house. I mean, we fill our house with stuff, don't we? 
Nobody likes to see an empty ladies just don't like to see an empty house. If it's if it move into that house, you're gonna put this, you're gonna put stuff on the walls. I mean that's just what everybody does. It's stuff. When we die, we hand it down to our children. They put it on their walls and so on and so on and so on. And Paul called every bit of this dung. So look at what he said. He said, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of how many things? And do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. So think about it. Even all the stuff that you had in your prophet column, how did you get it? God gave it to you. You say, well, I work for it. There's people in some places that have worked four times as hard as you have in your life and have absolutely nothing. Because they just live in a poor, impoverished nation. We've seen them in Kenya making gravel, literally, guys sitting there with hammers beating rocks until they were gravel size. We don't make gravel that way here. Those guys work four times as hard as most people in this country, and they've got nothing for it. So everything that we have was given to us by God anyway. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. So you know that you really are serving God when you can take every one of those things out of that column knowing that you have them by the grace of God, put them over in the lost column. Because really, the only thing that you can take with you to your death is your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he saved your soul. That's, that's what you keep. Be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Would you be willing to give up everything in this world for the cause of Christ? You might as well get that in your mind because you're going to. You're going to. All of that stuff, according to First Peter, where is it? What's going? Or Second Peter, where is it going? going to, God's going to melt it with all of the fervent heat. It's going to be gone. Even so, Amen. Amen.